started, and I will share my screen. Um, right. So uh, this is a case study, which uh, uh, is published, and it's based on this paper here. If any of you want to go find it. Um, uh, this paper was uh, published uh, back in 2018 uh, by myself, uh, uh, Alberta Health Science uh, Health Services colleague, Alex Doroshenko, who's also a, a co-lead on several modeling projects with us involving agent-based modeling, pertussis and chickenpox and some measles. Um, and uh, uh, it's been, uh, it's, it's a, uh, application of particle filtering that I think rather nicely illustrates the power of these techniques. So um, while we've applied most of our particle filter models more recently uh, in on contemporary data and for forward-leaning data, uh, data for, for anticipating what's coming, um, so data up to present, this actually worked on um, pre-vaccination era data sets um, on on measles, um, and in uh, particularly for our province, where this uh, data is freely available on a monthly by a month by month basis, for summaries of measles cases across the entire population, as well as um, uh, yearly reported cases in six different age groups. Um, so uh, the basic um, format of the the model is is one that's laid out here. Um, uh, our colleague Pesh Rohani, um, with whom we've recently uh, submitted a paper involving pertussis agent-based modeling, uh, was one of the co-leads, and as was David Earn uh, here, and and it's a model of of of, of measles um, that it has a very simple structure, SCIR model. So all this should be quite familiar to you. You have um, uh, some uh, some infection going on here, progression from a latent state to an infectious state in recovery, and you have some risk of leaving the system or death. Um, and uh, here, uh, we're going to be examining the case of uh, uh, where we have age stratification. So uh, the population is divided into two age groups here, uh, adults and children. And we examined two different thresholds by which to classify them, or, or Shayan did, um, kind of classifying adults being those 15 and up, um, and children those um, less than 15. Um, I can't remember on which side 15 uh, uh, fell, adult or, or child, or, or doing it for, for five-year age categories. Now, if you haven't seen this before, this may look a little bit forbidding, but um, the basic idea is you have two layers of this model. There's the susceptible, uh, exposed, infectious, recovered for children at the bottom, and then for adults at a higher level. Um, and they're running in parallel. So we have you know, some number of susceptible children and susceptible, some number of susceptible adults, some number of exposed children, and some number of exposed adults, et cetera. Um, and uh, they run largely in parallel, but they're not solitudes, they interact. And, and they interact through this mixing matrix um, uh, that, that here characterizes, um, uh, characterizes them with the idea being a child can affect an adult and an adult can affect a child, as well as a child infecting a child and a child in an adult. So there's some um, frequency of contact between children and children, children and adults, adults and children, and adults and adults. Um, and of course, if a child uh, is at risk, uh, is, has contact with a child, so these frequencies of contact, um, if a child has contact with a child, another child, What's germane for the probability of that other child to be infected is the the infection rate among children. Um, if a child were to infect an adult, similarly, it's this infection rate among children. 
that's germane. But if an adult has contact with a child, you want to consider that child's chance of infect of in being infected. You have to consider what fraction of adults are are indeed infected. So there's a little bit of of matrix math here. Now, this is one of the things I wanted to talk about the most. But before doing that, maybe I'll I'll start diving into this model here. Um, and apologies, this is a um, probably a, a slightly different model than you're dealing with in its details, but it's going to capture the essentials. This is the uh, two age group um, a model. So here we have susceptible, exposed, infectious, and recovered, and we have a total population. Um, and there's a death rate and and births occurring here. This is the same 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 model we've been we've been dealing with. Um, and you have progression of people onwards here. Remember with particle filtering, um, you have a, uh, a, a progression on of particles in the model that evolve according to standard model equations between, uh, between observations. So if you look at, uh, for example, the formulas uh, involved here, you'll find some some pretty familiar ones. I'll come back to this one here because it has a, a little bit of a twist. But you'll notice, for example, this one from exposure to infectious. It it shouldn't be any surprise to you. Um, there should be exposure times some. Um, it's it's divided by a latent period. It's sort of a reciprocal of the latent period. Um, similarly, for going from infectious onto recovered, you have it um, uh, this uh, infectious this infectious period one over the infectious period times the number infectious. Um, so here we have uh, standard equations uh, that evolve this. Now, an exception to these is this one right here um, involving a, uh, a Poisson um uh a, a poisson distributed um transmission um uh transmission equation here and basically what this is saying is that um you've got some force of infection occurring you've got some number of susceptibles um and then you have um a uh a a chance uh at that rate of having having infection occurring. So the a Poisson process is going to reflect um, the count of events that have occurred of a certain rate um, uh, within a, a given give it, give it a period of time. So this Poisson, uh, this call to Poisson here is basically asking how many particular infections occurred uh, during this time period. Um, uh, and uh, here we have a, uh, a very small time period, numerical integration time step. Uh, and the force of infection is the chance per unit time of getting infected. And here's the number at risk. So uh, we have a, uh, we have a, a certain number of uh, infections that will occur during that time. And then this division by numerical integration time step turns that into a rate. In general, when we have, we have these flows here, we're specifying a rate, how many people per unit time. And to, in order to turn this number of people can return by Poisson into a rate, you divide it by this, this time step. Um, so that's one source here of of uh, variability, um, but there's others as well. And you can see here, um, there's a, an additional state variable, an additional stock that's evolving. And if you look, it's evolving according to what appears to be a random walk. This is reference to random walk standard deviation. To explain that, I wanna go back to the paper here. So with, um, with these models, um, uh, it's quite typical that you will have some additional state variables that will capture changing 
parameter values. Um, uh, for example, here, uh, changing associated with the contact rate uh, or changing here uh, associated with a, a reporting rate. Now, there's also beyond those, those uh, random evolution of these variables, there's going to be a Poisson distribution for this transition. Remember that particle filtering runs a model uh, over time between observations according to standard equations. These for particle filtering to be meaningful, this has to be a stochastic model. It doesn't make sense to run common filtering or, or particle filtering or particle MCMC with a model that doesn't have stochastics. If it doesn't have stochastics, you could, you could use MCMC with it. You just specify the parameters, it would exactly give you the, the value of the latent state. Remember that filtering is used when we have stochastics. We may know the parameters. We may have very good estimates of those, but what the state is of the model, how many people right now are susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, we won't be sure if it's a stochastic model because it's, it's variable. Maybe through chance events, there's an outbreak started yesterday, or maybe it's only gonna start next week. We're not sure. And there's a lot of variability. And filtering is all about estimating this latent state, estimating the underlying situation. here. And uh, part of that capturing these stochastics. So here we have stochastics along two lines. Only one of them is shown in this particular version I'm showing you of, of the model, but it's this uh, change in disease transmission rate. So here there's a there is a random walk going on in this. It starts at some value. Um, and after that, it undergoes a random walk where in each little bit of time, it, it draws from a normal distribution with a standard deviation of this. Uh, believe it or not, in any logic, the first argument to normal is a standard deviation, which is weird. It's, it's downright perverse, but um, anyway. Um, so that's representing this. And we denote this as, a, as D, W sub T, um, what's called a Wiener process. This is a classic form of notation that's used for stochastic systems. This is undergoing what's called a random walk. Um, now you may say like, why in the world would you wanna have a dynamic model where one of the state variables is just a random walk. Well, um, you can't have that in a normal simulation model. I mean, it, you, you might want to do that to capture effects of weather, for example. You, you want to have a random walk in terms of the amount of precipitation. Though it wouldn't be normally distributed. It wouldn't go negative. But with these models, remember that a particle filtering model is a lot more than a simulation model. It's an inference technique. It infers about the situation. And what we're going to be doing is inferring the particles um, uh, state. And one, we're going to be favoring particles that have a state most consistent with the observed data. And we want the particles to have a requisite variety. So there are some particles that posit things um, that might better explain the observed data, no matter what happens. And here, um, one component of that might be human behavior. We don't know what human behavior is going to do. So we have different particles that posit different things about human behavior right now. And the way you do that is you have a random walk. So particles believe something right now about human behavior. And over time, they change their belief in random ways. And what it's always doing is finding the particles that are um, that make a, a be, uh, an assumption about the state of the model, including human behavior, that are most consistent with the observed data. So it's going to be zeroing in on values uh, of, on particles which have contact rate assumptions that are most consistent with the data. And so our original model had these equations in it. But now they've been supplemented. 
they've been supplemented to have some additional equations that involve random walks. And two of them are shown here. One is uh, involving um, this uh, evolution of a random walk in terms of the contact rate, and another in terms of the, uh, the, the fraction of people that are, uh, that are reported, uh, of inf infections that are reported as infections. This is another big, big issue, right? Um, with measles, it's probably pretty close to one. With COVID-19, it might have been closer to 50% or 40%, depending where you are and the amount of ca uh, case finding that was going on. Um, with something like flu, what you see is probably maybe 2% or 3% or 1%. Uh, foodborne illness, maybe it's 0.15% is I think an estimate I've heard. So one thing we're doing here is we're also allowing our assumption about reporting rate to vary. Now, normally we do this within a range, but, um, and there, there's ways to do that, to let it only vary within a certain range. Here, we've allowed it to vary between, um, uh, between zero and one. Um, and this is what's uh, called uh, a, a transformation. It's a transformation of the variable. You logit transform it. Um, and, uh, and basically, uh, if, if this will allow this thing to wander between zero to minus infinity to plus infinity, and that will lead CR to vary between uh, zero and one. Um, I'll see if I can come back and explain that at some point, but this is very common. If we have a, if we have a parameter that we wanna have vary over time, we often will transform it uh, before allowing it to vary in a random walk. For example, we take the log of beta and allow that to vary in a random walk from minus infinity to plus infinity. If the log varies from minus infinity to plus infinity, beta itself, the log of beta varies from minus infinity to plus infinity, beta will vary between zero and infinity. Um, uh, and similarly, if the log of this thing varies from minus infinity to plus infinity, C sub R will vary from zero to one. Um, and variants of this can be used very nicely to limit CR to smaller ranges, for example, and only do range, uh, a range of, of variability. So um, in general, we're gonna have, uh, uh, we're going to have parameters that vary um, as some of our state variables. This is a notable component of particle filtering in practice. It's adding requisite variability about certain uncertainties that need to be inferred. And one of the things that needs to be inferred centrally here is, is aspects of human behavior. Um, so Shoyan made use of uh, of two different structures here. Uh, one was the model for an aggregate model. Um, this is available on GitHub. Um, and, and then secondly, for a, um, an age-structured model. For, for those who are on GitHub here, if you go into the models area, you'll find the aggregate model here, and then you'll find the, uh, the, the child, child adult model um, here, which, uh, which has a, um, a, an age threshold of 15 between children and adults, and another one uh, age five here. Um, so, so this was uh, the, the model that's employed um, uh, with these two age groups um, that, that's used here. Now, the likelihood functions need to be talked about. Um, and uh, you may recall that each particle evolves between points of observation according to normal equations. These are, sorry, these are the normal equations here. It just evolves in, in line with these equations. Mind you, they involve some stochastic components, but it just evolves according to that no interaction between particles. It's when an observation occurs, that's when 
the particles are held up to a cone. That's when there's this judgment day, when they're, they're, uh, they're scrutinized against the crucible of empirical evidence. What happens here? Well, for the aggregate model, we're going to be assessing the model state against one thing, which is the number of cases observed for you know, on a, on a per month basis, the, the monthly um, number of cases observed. Uh, and we're going to do so, um, which are, uh, in a way that makes use of a distributional assumption. And the assumption is called the negative binomial distribution, and it's shown here. I'd like to switch to the model so you can see where this is going on. Um, so within this model, um, there's uh, a couple empirical event, a couple events. And one of them is called receive empirical observation. Okay. Um, and if you go find that, I found it through this interface up here going into events, receive empirical observation. Here we go. And this is something which starts um, uh, at, at a certain number of, of months in uh, the first reporting period. And then it goes every month, this is gonna go. So we're simulating every month, this model is getting new data, okay? Um, every month it's waking up to a new observation. What's gonna happen here? Well, um, uh, basically it's going to check, okay, Am I performing a particle filter? Um, we, we can run this model without a particle filter to see how it would behave without being corrected in this way. But, but if we're performing a particle filter, we're going to process this new empirical observation. Um, we're gonna come back to this because there's a few other points here of, of interest, but let's go dive into that. So basically we're gonna, process this observation by using the likelihood. And then we may do some, um, uh, some, uh, some information, uh, do some updates uh, associated with reporting, but let's go in here. Here's the new empirical observation. There we go. Okay. Um, and the basic deal here is, okay. Um, if we have, if we're still processing observations, if we're not just comparing against them, okay? Um, then we want to update our weights based on the observation. You may remember that, but basically a, a key component of the particle filtering is you, uh, after an observation, each particle's weight is multiplied by the value of the likelihood function um, for that particle of observing that data. So a particle that has a state that posits an underlying situation in the model that says, that predicts with high likelihood what's observed empirically, it will have a high likelihood function. Now the likelihood function for that particle will be very large. Mm. And as a result, its weight will be updated by multiplying its weight It'll get a new weight that's its old weight times the value of the likelihood function. It will be a big weight because we give it a lot of credibility. We say, this is a well-predicting particle. This particle has credibility. It has, it's predicting well. By contrast, a particle which posits an underlying state, which is not consistent with the observation would tend to have a very low one. Now, in this case, what is this observation? Well, the observation involves a number of cases of reported illness. And uh, each of the individuals who is ill in the population is going to have a certain probability of being reported. Uh, and we make use of a binomial likelihood function for reasons I talked about last time, which is that it allows for some possibility you may have a larger number of reported cases than you do 
actual number of people. So uh, number of people who are sick. X sub K is the number of people who are ill in the model at that time. R is a dispersion parameter. And we're basically going to compute this, um, this uh, value P and plug it into here to get the likelihood of observing um, this many reported cases of measles uh, based on the particle state um, and, and specifically based on the number of particle people that the model um, thinks would be, um, would be reported. Okay, so let's, let's go back and look at how this is captured here. So here we have update weights based on observation. I'm going to click on this. By the way, I'm holding down the control key and pressing the, the button here. And now we see the, the core logic associated with this. Um, and essentially what you're going to see here is a uh, getting the empirical data. We get how many cases were reported. Um, and we're going to consider that for every particle. So for every particle, we've got to compute this likelihood function and multiply the weight by it. OK, so we're going to go through all the particles here. I'll, I'll make this um, uh, full screen here. So we're going to go through all particles. And for each particle, we're going to compute the likelihood function. Um, and, and how are we going to do that? Well, um, what we're going to do is, is ask, OK, what would the likelihood function be, um, uh, given that it's a negative binomial likelihood, given that we have this empirical um, infectious, uh, empirical number of observed cases on the one hand, versus what the model actually observes. What does the model predict for this? Um, and that will lead us to have a, a likelihood function. This function here, d likelihood of reports, that's going to go through the mechanics of actually computing exactly this value. It calls off to a function and a math commons library that computes it from a Pascal distribution, um, which is a close cousin to the negative binomial. It's basically another form of the negative binomial. Um, now, there's a little bit of additional mechanics here because for the case where we have, um, where we have data coming in both monthly and yearly, yearly data is broken down by age groups Monthly data is just aggregate. Um, so we always have aggregate data, but sometimes we have uh, data by age group. Um, and uh, that's, what's, uh, that's what's going on. I'm going to go a bit light on that right now. I'm glad to answer questions on it. Uh, but what's going on here is that having gotten the likelihood here, we are going to take the old weight the prior weight for this particle, for this particular particle, and we're going to update it, um, this prior weight, by a, uh, a likelihood, okay, um, to get a posterior weight. And then we assign it back to our weights. Now, this line here, which is determining the full likelihood, is going to consider this monthly likelihood and any yearly likelihood. Um, if, if, we're, if we're considering age specific likelihood functions, then we're gonna, we're gonna have a separate likelihood for, for the year because we have age, age specific data. But if we're just dealing with the aggregate, basically we only have one, uh, the other one is one, and uh, we'll just has, have this monthly, um, monthly one. So this is our weights. We update the weight, and then we're, we're totaling up the weights over time. We're totaling up the weights for all the different particles. Why? So we can normalize them back to one. And so we're totaling them up. 
totaling them up. And, and then at the end, we, we basically are going to normalize the weights and, and reset the weights to all sum to one. So, so this is this update weights based on observation. Um, it's going to, to update it based on the actual observed, um, observed values. And this is all within this, um, uh, this process, new empirical observation. Um, and having done that, having updated the weights, having multiplied the weights for every particle, by the value of the likelihood or, or successive likelihoods, then what we're going to do is consider is our effective sample size. Are we carrying around too many particles which have really low weights associated with them? Are we carrying around lots of dead wood? And if we are, if we're carrying around lots of particles which aren't worth their weight in beans, they're just low plausibility particles. They're very poor performing. Then we're going to have a time where we're going to redistribute the, the, the particles to, to put emphasis on the ones that are competitive. So we will go through and we will perform this resampling process. Now you may remember that resampling involves, um, and I don't know if we have a picture of it here. Um, I wanna I wanna finish this, but the resampling involves. Um, uh, okay, I thought I I had a nice nice picture, but um, alas, um, yeah. Um, uh, resampling involves. Um, wow. Okay. I guess it's really not there. Okay, that's that's too bad. Um, so resampling basically involves um, causing particles with high weights to multiply and those with low weights to die out. And, and that's what's going on in the resampling process. Resampling for this model is also a kind of low, um, uh, it, it's very standardized process, but it is specific to the model. So this resample and update weights and particles, um, uh, which is located right here, basically does two things. It updates the particles with their resampled indices. So it, it lets ones with high weights multiply by doing a binomial draw conceptually. It draws, it draws essentially particles according to their weights and, um, and basically uses them for the new set of particles. And then we're going to set all weights to one. That's what's going on here. And if you go in and you find this update particle weights with resampled indices, you'll find a lot of kind of boilerplate code specific to this model structure, which basically goes and uh, squirrels away the data um, for the old particles, um, figures out what particles going to going to go into each new slot and and goes and sets those particle values to be in that slot of the um, uh, of the of the particles. So there's kind of this uh, resampling process that that uh, is going to um, have uh, each new particle uh, at each position each uh, index of the, um, of the set of all particles be taken from a particle that was drawn from the last, uh, the last little bit, same time, but drawn from before the resampling took place. And, and that's exactly what's going on here if I were to break it down. I wanna finish the example, but I'm, I'm glad to go into that code if anyone is interested. Um, okay, so, um, what we've seen is that basically the model um, the model runs normally between points with this stochastic system. At observation points, it performs this uh, incorporation of the new data. The key component of that incorporation of the new data 
is computing for every particle a likelihood and multiplying the current weight by that likelihood. And then having so done, having, having performed that, um, we then renormalize the weights to sum to one and potentially we do a resampling and, and set all weights to one um, following that. This age stratified model involves a little bit more detail. Here, we have the aggregate data as we do in all months, but we also have uh, yearly adult and yearly child data we have to take into account. We have observations on an age specific basis on a yearly basis. So for year end, we have more likelihood functions if for an age stratified model. We, at year end, we're gonna consider for each of these likelihoods, these sub likelihood functions, what's the likelihood we'd observe the monthly data? That's kind of a standard one. Um, but what's the likelihood we would observe the age specific data? Um, and again, these are one if, if we're not at the year end, if we don't have new data coming in. This is important. I, I want to draw your, your attention to this. This is actually a really important point. You can readily run particle filter models even when data is only occasionally available. So you can have a likelihood that has you know, 10 different things in it and different subsets of that likelihood are used for a given circumstance. So on those days where you have wastewater data available, you use it. On those data where you have, on those days where you have age specific data available, you use it. On those days where you have just aggregate data, you use that. Um, you can use any combination on different days of data by simply um, having a likelihood function that will tolerate it. And one of the tricks of the trade here is you could have a multiplicative likelihood where if you're missing a certain sort of data on a certain day, I suppose you don't have wastewater data for that day, you just treat that likelihood as one for that day. You, it's kind of a vacuous thing. We, we have no data, and so the model's considered with respect to that perfectly fine. We're, we're, we, basically, we can't, we, we can't judge it. Um, and all the, other, all the other components, the likelihood will still function. So when you're missing data, just use a one as to value the likelihood. Okay, so you know <laughs> when this model was calibrated, you can actually find here um, a calibrated version of this model. So so she she calibrated the model there um, as best she could, and as as expected, it grew increasingly disconnected. Um, tuning parameters is just not going to help you predict the timing of this, and it's not going to help sync the model up with it. Um, um, instead, the, the particle filter is able to, to really follow. Its state follows what's observed quite well. It's, it, it will be preferring those particles that assumed, hey, you know, there's, there's an outbreak here. Um, those, some of those particles, either be, by dint of having a high um, contact rate or, or high number of susceptibles will be pre predicting a, 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 an outbreak. And the particle filter will be selecting those and giving them more credibility for this phase. And that will allow it to rise to the occasion. Um, and those particles that are anticipating a drop here will be fostered, will be fruitful and multiply, and it will follow this down. And so it's you know, building its credibility, it's, it's listening to all the particles and lending credibility to the ones that are following this, um, the observed data in a way that over time allows it to follow this data really well. It's investing in those particles that have a view of the situation consistent with the data. The more data we have, the more informed that investing on in the particles. Now, um, uh, this is occurring not just for the aggregate, um, the, the overall count of infections, but for each of the age groups, for child 
or for adults. And this shows kind of what the model expected versus what the, the, the actual data proved. And what you can see is it's, it's following this pretty well. Part of that is it is adjusting according to likelihood, but part is, and this is an important point, there's logic to the situation. You know, it takes time to get sick. It takes time to spread it. The people who are at risk are susceptibles. If there was a, a big outbreak just now uh, here, there's going to be few susceptibles after that. That's the theory captured by the model, right? Um, the, this is the model theory. The model captures the theory. And if there was a big outbreak and that last little bit, the, most particles are going to have S be very, very low. Um, to have been consistent with that observation, S will be low for them. And as a result, they can only square with the data in ways that make sense given the theory. Um, you're not gonna have any particles that are just totally saying nonsensical things. It all is gonna be in line with this theory. Um, all particles are gonna be governed by the iron laws of how infectious disease spread the natural history of infection, et cetera. And that's what's going on here. And that's what allows it to nail, you know, the child, the child number of, of reported infections, so the adult report, it's just nailing it. It's also able to observe underlying things that, you know, we can't directly observe. These are things we can observe and we expect the model to accord with them. These we can observe, we expect the model to accord with them. But the model is predicting certain things underneath, um, which we can't directly observe in general, the number of latently infected people or the true number of people in the adult age category who are infected, never mind putting aside how many were reported, or the number that are recovered, or the number who are still susceptible. Um, these things are implied at any one time by the state of the system. And we can always go and, and report those. Now, one thing that Shaoyan did with this model, which I think is very powerful, um, is to predict forward. This is what we did with the COVID-19 pandemic with our models to support um, surge planning. You, you predict forward and it anticipates what's going to be happening over the next bunch of months. And in general, it tends to be very good. And we'll see that. This is anecdotal evidence of it. But if you kind of ask, OK, model, consider only those up to here. These are the red ones. And it's not considering any after this in its particle filtering. But we're just projecting it forward. The particle filter gets stopped. All we're doing is running the particles forward en masse. Um, and then we're sampling from them to ask, we're, the weights are staying the same. Whenever, remember, whenever we draw from the particles, we're doing so with a probability of drawing each according to its weight. It doesn't make sense to grab a particle without considering its weight. Particles only are in the distribution um, weight uh, according to their weight. Um, if they have a weight of two, they're twice as common in the distribution as a weight of one. So you have to always draw from the distribution of particles by drawing particles with a, a chance of drawing each according to its weight. That's what's called important sampling. And here, if we do that going forward, we'll see the models anticipating this, this outbreak. It's, it hasn't been told about it. It's only considering data up to here, but it's anticipating. It's anticipating this outbreak. Um, and you know it is projecting forward the number of susceptibles. It's not quite sure if it will stay low or go high, but it's pretty sure it won't lie um, here. It's, it's anticipating what the number of exposed individuals will be or, or children who are in the recovered state or what have you. Um, and in general, it's, it's very good at this. It, it can predict forward. Let's go examine just how good it is here. We, we kind of anecdotally have tried it in a bunch of cases and see and found it worthy. Um, uh, you know, we, we see here it can anticipate the drop, for example. Um, but let's let's take a look at um, and, and how just how good it is. Well, first of all, um, 
we can assess how well it matches the data by comparing a how discrepant is the particle filtering's observation versus um, uh, versus what we get uh, uh, without particle filtering? And the answer is it it matches the data a lot better. Um, even an aggregate version of it matches uh, a lot better than a calibrated model. A calibrated model, you know, captures some essential features of the situation, but you know, after a while, it kind of matches kind of the mean or or something there. Not very, not very impressive. Here we can we can do a lot better than that by a factor of about five times better. Um, uh, perhaps here. I mean, not not five. Okay, so this is like maybe uh, forty versus uh, one hundred sixty. So about four factor four. Um, this is actually one of the best. This is a two age group model, and you can see it can do better yet um, here. So it, it has less discrepancy. Okay, fine. But to what degree can it predict forward? And this is where the machine learning um, component of it maybe really stands out. What if we were considered the particle filtering as predicting forward whether or not there would be an outbreak in the next little bit? How if we were asking it to anticipate forward whether there'll be an outbreak in the next month or the next three months? How good would it be? How well would it predict? And that's what's depicted, ladies and gentlemen, here. This is the so-called receiver operating characteristic curve. This is uh, a, an emblematic um, way of assessing the adequacy or the power, the accuracy of classification mechanisms. It can be, it could take a little bit of adjustment getting used to it. So I wanna orient you. I, I recognize we'll need to finish up soon. In the x-axis, we have something called false positive rate, okay? Um, so this would be the number of times where it's, uh, it, it, an outbreak does occur, but it didn't catch it. Um, it said, um, it said no, but in fact there, there, there was one. Um, the true positive rate uh, is the number of times where it, um, uh, it, it, it indicated okay, it, there will be an outbreak, uh, and in fact there, there was one. Okay, um, so, uh, so here. So, excuse me, so, so false positive would be, um, in fact, there was none, but it said there would be. So this is crying wolf. Um, this would be crying wolf. It's, it's saying there's gonna be an outbreak and there, there in fact was not going to be one. Uh, it's a false, false positive. Um, the test said, yes, we're going to, we're gonna have an outbreak and there in fact wasn't one. This is true positive. And you'd expect some trade-off, right? If, if you just always said, there's gonna be an outbreak, you'd have high true positive, but very low false positive. I mean, a very poor false positive. The false positive rate would be, 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 be very, very, uh, very, very high. Um, um, uh, and uh, you'd, be, you'd be doing very, very poorly. Um, uh, if, if you were to say there's not going to be an outbreak, you'd, you'd never be wrong in the side of crying wolf, um, but you would always be wrong in the side of, uh, of, of, uh, of predicting an outbreak. So here we have this tension. We don't want to cry wolf too often. We don't want to say there will be an outbreak when there's not one, but we also don't want to just say there's not going to be an outbreak and there is one. Um, and that's what this curve helps us assess. Um, we, what we would like is a, uh, an area under this curve, which is one. Um, we would like something which, which um, uh, has minimal false positive rate and extremely high true positive rate. We, if we could achieve a perfect prediction, whenever there's going to be a, an outbreak, we call it. But we never have 
a false positive. We never cry wolf. That would be ideal, right? If this could, if this could shoot up here. And so we have no crying wolf and we're always right about there's going to be an outbreak. That would be ideal. Um, we would have a, uh, an area under the curve of one. It would shoot up here and it would stay at one up here. We could, we could always cry wolf if we want to, but, um, but we can always get true positive rate of, of one, even with no crying wolf. By contrast, um, uh, you know, in, in reality, we, we generally don't have that option, right? We, we have to trade off. We, we have to accept the risk of crying wolf um, in order to get, to be sure we're not going to miss an, out, an actual outbreak occurring. So you typically see a, an incomplete curve, something whose area under the curve is less than one. Um, uh, we wouldn't be doing a very good job if it was just like 50%, it would, you're flipping coins, for example. Um, but here, what we see is an area under the curve that actually is surprisingly close to one. It's, 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 it's near, it's about 89%, which is very good. What this is saying is essentially with, with virtually no crying wolf, risk of crying wolf, we could capture, you know, depending what you're calling virtually no, about 50% of all outbreaks we could call. Um, and if we're willing to call uh, to cry wolf 20% of the time, in other words, say there's going to be an outbreak when there's not one, we can get about 90% uh, true positivity. Um, uh, we could get about 60% of, we could call all cases that are going to be an outbreak if we're willing to have less than 10% risk of crying wolf. So this is a, a trade-off, right? That you could, you could give to someone who's a policy analyst or a decision maker, how much What's what's your trade off that you want? I could, I could, you know, call, cry wolf no less than five percent of the times, but then I could only predict about a little bit over fifty percent of all outbreaks uh, a month ahead. Or if you're willing for me to err on the side of of calling them more accurately, I could call them eighty percent of the time with about seven, about maybe fifteen uh, percent crying wolf. Um, what's your trade off? What do you want? So this is an ROC curve. And, and generally speaking, uh, if you can have an area under the curve upwards of you know, 85%, that's very, very good. Um, so what, what this is saying is this model that is shown here um, can be very effective at predicting outbreak status. Um, and this was based on the simplest possible analysis. Um, uh, what classifies an outbreak? We basically took a voting of the particles, um, of the sampled particles. You could do a much more sophisticated machine learning based uh, approach based on the particle state. Um, so uh, that's, that's a real advantage uh, of this. You could use it to predict forward. And even the most basic way of using it can get you quite good results in terms of anticipating outbreaks. But there's something else we can do, which is to, to use it to ask about intervention results. So building up this model, estimating the current situation puts us in a really good position to ask, what would the gain be for quarantine? What would the gain be if we were to uh, declare an outbreak response immunization campaign? What would the gain be to up our contact tracing game or to to have um, mass testing or what have you. You can use a model like this, having estimated it with particle filtering, having estimated that state, the S, the E, the I, the, the number of susceptibles exposed, infected, recovered, by estimating that with particle filtering as it is at the current point, using all this past data to get us there, we can then ask, what would the gain be for different interventions? And we could examine it going forward probabilistically by just implementing those interventions and then running the model forward. And that's um, something that uh, is quite favorable. We could compare different interventions given the uncertainty about the current state. Anyway, um, that was, uh, that's what's in this model. And I, I've tried to 
you know, alert you to some of the main structures here. This re report empirical observation, process new empirical observation, and updating the weights based on the observations. This is exactly the sort of uh, core structure that we've been talking about uh, with, the, with the particle filtering. Um, these are exactly the steps that we were talking about, for example, in this, uh, in this um, slide where we were talking about taking the prior weight. Um, that is what, what this is, taking the, the prior weight. Uh, sorry, it was down here. Um, taking the, uh, the prior weight and, and then uh, taking evaluated the likelihood functions um, for the uh, observing the empirical data given the state. So this is the empirical data given the state of the particle. That's exactly what this is computing the likelihood given the particle state, including notably the model incidence here. And uh, having computed those likelihoods, that's what uh, uh, this, this final likelihood is. Then we update the prior weight by multiplying by it. That's exactly what's going on. We, we take these likelihoods, we multiply it by the, so we take a composite likelihood and we update the weight. That's what that is. The composite likelihood exactly corresponds to, um, to this. Uh, and having, having so done, we're going to need to normalize the weights at the end. Um, uh, so we, we have um, unnormalized weights, and then we take the normalization, weight normalization. So that's exactly what that is. I didn't show you that resampling, but this is uh, what, what occurred. Well, I, I showed you the glimpse of the code, but this is basically what's occurring. The high weight particles are multiplied. The low weight particles disappear. And the medium weight particles tend to, you know, a few of them, uh, they, they get here and there, they get propagated on. All of these become new particles at the same time, and then they run forward and evolve stochastically according to the stochastics. So that's a little complete example of particle filtering. I'm hoping that that will offer some a uh, bit of understanding about how it integrates a little bit with the code. And uh, I'd be glad to answer questions during office hours about it. So thank you very much.